Hello, I'm Emily Francis, and welcome to our special Holy Land Uncovered episode on location in Porto, Portugal, a beautiful city along the Douro River, which has thrived since ancient times. Join us as we dive deeply into the Jewish history of Porto and also explore the modern city, which is a must visit destination for tourists from around the world. of the Sephardic Jews who were kicked out of Portugal started making their way back into Porto and other cities in the 19th century. And by the 20th century, Ashkenazi refugees also found home here. Almost 100 years ago, the Kadori Makor Chaim Synagogue that we are in front of was officially inaugurated. And still to this day, it is the largest synagogue in the Iberian Peninsula. Here's more on the history. We're now so happy to be joined by Gabriel Sondorovich, the president of the Porto Jewish Community. Hello, and thank you so much for hosting us here in Porto. We're just having such an amazing time. Hello, you are more than welcome. It's hard to believe that this is a 100-year-old synagogue and a very big deal that this synagogue even exists after nothing being here for 500 years. Yes, absolutely. It is, uh, the synagogue amazes me since the first day I was here. It's so beautiful. It's so uh, Portuguese. Uh, I was very impressed. It's, it was very different from the synagogues from Brazil, where I came from. How many people in general are, are here and part of the community now in Porto? Okay, we have uh, around a thousand members in the community, not only in the city of Porto, but uh, in the surrounding cities. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they don't come every week, these thousand people. They join us for the big holidays. Uh, but we do have a minion, a consecutive minion of uh, nine years in a row mm -hmm. for every Shabbat. Our main goal is to make history, as you say, to honor the Jewish uh, members that were here in Oporto many centuries ago, and also to keep the Jewish life flourishing here in the city. But is the community uh, only made up of uh, Jews that originally came from Portugal, or is it also mixed with Ashkenazim from Europe? It's mixed. We have uh, the majority of our members are from uh, Sephardic origin, but we do have some Ashkenazi members, as myself. <laughs> the, we have over 25 or 30 nationalities represented in this community. Our members came from uh, Venezuela, Brazil, United States, Mexico, Turkey, all over the world. It's a very quiet city, comfortable, safe city, and the community plays a vital role in the decision of the newcomers to stay here mm -hmm. because uh, we have uh, many facilities. Uh, we have all the facilities to, to, to keep a Jewish life. We have a mikvahot, we have a, a kosher store, we have restaurants, we have everything. Uh, tell us why that is uh, so unique. Yeah, community. because um, we usually say that we are one of the strongest Jewish organizations in the world. We say so not because of the number of members or because the uh, financial capabilities, not, uh, nothing of that. We say so because we have uh, a huge organization. We have a museum, we have a cultural department, we have a kosher department, we have a, a restaurant store. We have everything a Jewish uh, people need to stay here. Gabrielle, thank you so much for thank your you. hospitality and for sharing your journey and you're doing an excellent job and keep up the good work, my friend. Thank you very much. I do my best. You are more than welcome. Thank you. During the COVID pandemic, members of the community accomplished a major task. Not only did they build a Holocaust museum, but also an entire Jewish museum. It's an intersection of the new and the old. 
The Holocaust Museum of Porto opened its doors in 2021, offering free admission to students and adults alike. What I can tell you is that most Portuguese families uh, know that they have some kind of Jewish background. The key way that our community can fight anti-Semitism, not only today, but for the future, because we're talking about young people here, is through education. And we're very proud of the fact that in two years, we've had 100,000 school students here, which represents 20% of the school population in Portugal. Emily, I want to show you this very special room, our memorial room. It has the names of 32,000 victims of our locals. The museum's director, Michael Leo Rothwell, has a personal connection to the Holocaust. Leonhard Bock, this is my grandfather. Leonhard my middle name is Leo, in memory of him. And just a bit further along is Elsa Bock, my grandmother. Wow. And as, as I mentioned to you earlier, it's a source of comfort to have my grandparents uh, remembered here. My mother uh, and my uncle managed to leave uh, Berlin on the kinder transport uh, in M April and May 1939. Um, I'm absolutely certain that was as a result of Kristallnacht that my grandparents decided that the children had to leave urgently. Did she ever talk about it? Uh, very little indeed. She didn't want to talk about it. What many people don't realize is that Portugal was an important stopover for Jewish refugees trying to flee Nazi Europe. In June 1940, when Hitler uh, conquered Paris, uh, all the Jews in Europe realized they were no longer safe in Europe. They had to leave Europe for the Americas or for Palestine. And the only way to do that was to travel to Portugal. As you know, Spain and Portugal were neutral countries uh, during the war. and. Uh, it was possible if you had a visa. Even though the Portuguese government was against it, as many as 150,000 Jewish refugees came through Portugal, many of whom as a result of a brave Portuguese consul in France. It's well known the heroic activity of um, uh, Aristide Sosemenge, who uh, against orders wrote many visas so that people, Jewish refugees, could be saved and could get to Portugal. He decided to follow his conscience and he wrote thousands of visas in a couple, few days and a few nights um, after speaking to, being uh, pleaded to by a rabbi. Even though the Jewish community has since flourished in Porto, the history of anti-Semitism is repeating itself. The synagogue was vandalized on March 11th, 2022, in what is now dubbed the Day of Shame. These are uh, local, specific, momentaneous uh, incidents. Uh, we cannot disregard uh, this, of course, but uh, uh, if we uh, concentrate on these kind of things, we are feeding uh, the eight feelings. Don't silence the crimes, but not uh, too much uh, giving, uh, too much importance uh, mm. to uh, something that really is not uh, meaningful. Breves palavras para agradecer. The Jewish community of Porto held a ceremony on the annual European Day of Jewish Culture. But in the shadow of October 7th, anti-Semitic protests and violence have only increased, forcing the Holocaust and Jewish museums to temporarily close for safety reasons. But everyone is trying to remain hopeful for a better future. It must be said that this impact we've had is thanks to the effort of the Portuguese school teachers. They have come from all over the country to bring their students here, realizing the difference it would make. And so the work we've been doing here has a huge impact 
on the future citizens of Portugal and uh, our hope is that of course those citizens will grow up and understand about something about Judaism, something about what the Jews have been through. to this a beautiful space, but also to show us some of your beautiful work. Namely, we have some paintings here. Yes. Um, explain to us kind of your work and your project and what this is in particular, why the history of the Inquisition is such an important story to tell, because it really defined what happened to the Jews 500 years ago. Absolutely. Uh, it's quite important to explain the Jewish history of, of, of Portugal because, in fact, in the curriculum, in the schools, we don't learn much about it. So uh, that's why we are trying to do for the last years to explain not only the students but all visitants, especially the non-Jewish visitants, uh, our, our Portuguese Jewish history. to people that don't know, you know, there was, they know about the 1492 expulsion, but they don't know the Portuguese side of it. Yes. Because the Portuguese let a lot of the Jewish families in and, and didn't want to expel them right away. Yes. Right? In fact, the Catholic kings uh, of Spain expelled the Jews in 1492, and Portugal received thousands of Jews in our, in our country. For example, just to talk about Porto, 30 of the most important families of Castile uh, came to live here in Porto, um, including the, the great rabbi, Isaac Aboab, probably the biggest theological Jewish authority at the time. a conversion went, they just went and dunked, said, here yes. you go, blah, 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 you're a Christian, just like that? The walking baptized. Many uh, episodes happen like this. Uh, people being forced to be baptized, and for me, to be a, ca a Catholic, you just need a baptism. And that was the main idea, the main royal idea, is to convert the Jews in order for them to stay here. In 1496, 20% of the Portuguese population was Jewish, 20%. Mm. I remind you that four years before, we received a huge wave of immigration from Spain. So uh, obviously, it will ruin our country uh, if we send away um, thousands and thousands of Jews. Unfortunately, four years later, in 1496, our King Manuel I also signed the Edict of Expulsion uh, because, in reality, he wanted to marry the Spanish princess uh, and was actually... The daughter of Ferdinand Isabella. Yes, and oh, yes. it was actually a Spanish demand, the so-called New Christians. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if I force you to change your religion in 10 months, you probably will say yes to protect your life and your family, uh, but we'll keep your religion in secret. That's what happened, right. and that justifies why, 40 years later, in 1536, we established the Inquisition. So what's the difference between these guys that got converted and what we have here, which is, you know, everybody who was a mystic or practicing Jews, they were a yes. heretic and they were burned at the stake. This happened a lot, yes? Yes, and obviously, if you baptize people, they are, in theory, Catholics. Uh, but if you don't give them education or religious education, they will keep their religion. And that's what happened, especially in the first decades after the expulsion um, and after the creation of Inquisition, where you have people practicing Judaism in secret. And uh, well, let's say, if you have a neighbor, if you have an ex-housekeeper uh, who don't like you, someone will knock the door of the Inquisition and say, oh, he's Jewish, he's not eating pork, he's praying in Shabbat. So you are arrested and you could be expelled from the country, you could be uh, in prison or even uh, wow. Killed. And yeah. when people were burned at the stake, they would gather, like crowds would come and gather. Yes, it was watch. actually yes, a party, it was actually a festival, a festival for all the city to watch. It was a huge festival, um, the so called Auto da Fe, no translation. Here you are, a historian, you've done this. You are, you are not a Jew, but it's very likely that you could be a descendant of because many new Christians became new Christians and they stayed. 
but explain, you, don't, you didn't learn this in school? Like all Portuguese, I truly believe that all Portuguese have a Jewish background somehow. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine that 20% of the Portuguese population was Jewish. If the majority of them stayed here in 1496, generations and generations, four centuries, almost five centuries, uh, probably we all have Jewish blood. And unfortunately in Portugal, we don't talk about the Jewish presence in Portugal or in Porto or in Portugal at all. Even in, uh, regarding the Inquisition, I learned at the school in five minutes that Inquisition was a hunting of witches, uh, even if the majority of accusations were against secret Jews. Uh, so it, it was quite terrible. That's why our, uh, we decided to create this department, this cultural department. That's why we decided to create um, the Jewish Museum mainly uh, to explain people how connected to us is the Jewish history. Why do you feel this is the best way, you know, for healing, for us to move forward, for us to discover who we are, what our ancestors Education went is the only tool we have, the only tool we have to combat anti-Semitism and to educate people. It's the only tool. Uh, and obviously we are not accusing nobody. Uh, but we cannot forget what happened in the past in order to prevent it happen again. How does that feel to know you've devoted your passion to this and you're actually seeing the fruits of it, isn't it? Not just members of the synagogue. Extremely right happy. The majority are not members of the community. I'm extremely happy. I truly believe that uh, in the next generation will be more aware of their past and the importance of these events uh, and the importance of tolerance. Hugo, thank you so thank much. You. you are such a, a fountain of knowledge. You're amazing, and thank you so much for all of your hard work. You're doing a great job. Thank you very much. And what you've done is just incredible. Thank you. Keep up the good work, my friend. We're about to introduce you to a woman named Isabel Lopez, who has taken it upon herself to reclaim the dignity of her grandfather, a World War I hero, who suffered for coming back to his Judaism and being part of the construction of the Kadori Synagogue. I'm very happy to meet you and get a chance to, to hear your story, so thank you. Thank you. Also, for me, it's very, very important yes. to speak with you. Also. So you are here filling the legacy of your grandfather, who was one of the founders of this synagogue. Yes. Tell us. I was seven years old when he died. Father's My grandfather name, yes. is Artur Carlos de Barros Basto. So explain what happened. So he was a Christian, like many people in Portugal, descendants of the Moranos. Yes. He was in World War I, and yes. he was a hero in World War I, yes? Yes, he was a hero. He has been um, he received lots of congratulations uh, due to the, he, what he has done during the war in France. Why did he get kicked out when he came back? Was he talking about being a Jew during yes. World War I, or this all happened when he came back as a, as a veteran? It, during the war, he found a rabbi, and when he arrived here, he was completely decided to be a Jew. He married with a a Jewish girl, and he came to Oporto, and he felt it was important to create the community, to found the community, Jewish community in Oporto, and the uh, synagogue. He began all his work with the, the work of rescue of the Maranas of the Kripstad Jews. It was, Did he know his whole life that he was a, a crypto Jew? Did he, he knew? Because many crypto Jews have no idea until now. Because his grandfather told him they were descendants of uh, crypto Jews. And he was 11 years old only, but he was so interested and he began to study uh, everything about since the Inquisition and the, the what happened in Portugal. So why did he get kicked out of the army for becoming, for embracing being a Jew? He was considered immoral to be Jew. The circumcision and all this was the reason why he was separated from the army. 
for him it was so bad because he was a hero. Uh, he was very proud to be in the, the army and he was forbidden to, to dress the, everything. To, it, he kept the, the things. When he died, he wanted to go to be dressed as a, after his death. So the, you buried him in, the, in his, in his yes. uniform? Yes. Wow. The only thing we kept it was the, the hat. Why have you taken it upon yourself to clear his name so he deserves the recognition for the great heroic work yeah. that he did, not only as a soldier, but as somebody who took a chance to ruin his life, yeah. to live his yeah. truth. My mother died in 2005, and then I began working here. The rehabilitation was possible in the parliament, and the, the parliament uh, recommended to the Portuguese government to make the real the reintegration in the army. The paper, the document saying that he should be a coronel since 1945. What would he be saying right now if he were alive, a hundred years later, yeah. this is his legacy? Yes, I think that for him justice has been done with all our work. Not the reintegration is so important for him, seeing uh, even children here in the synagogue. I am so happy now to be with Marilyn Flitterman, a 95-year young <laughs> Brooklynite, Queens native who's been living in Porto for how Fif many years? 52 years. 52 <laughs> years, that's my entire life. <laughs> how did you get from New York to Porto, besides an airplane. Yeah, well, we just decided that it was time to see the world, we decided to take a year off, and the one year turned into 52 years. So how did, but why Porto? It got good press, good press. There was a New York Times magazine cover 50 years ago, which said, Portugal is Europe's best kept secret. The food is good. The fish is fresh. The you fish know is where fresh. It's I, we, they they sell it just down the street in, in the little in the little bins, having just caught it. And there are absolutely no negatives. It wow. was it was a lucky lucky choice. So tell us the the secret formula to to uh, being ninety five. Still driving, still walking in, in, in shoes high heels. with a heel that I can't even walk in. What, what is the secret? Because we all want to be like you and live to 95. I really think it's the food I've been having in Portugal for the past 52 years. In America, everything is processed or canned or old. <laughs> also to take young kids out of the environment of you know the nest well, of New York. My 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 feeling is when you do something major, you don't ask your children, you tell them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the synagogue was here, we went to see it, and there were two to three people there. <laughs> A little different than Queens of Brooklyn. <laughs> I know you're a pianist. I'm a pianist. It's more player. than a hobby. Was it a profession yeah. for you? It was a profession. I. Ah, you see that roof over there? Yes. That was a bar. 
that was a little restaurant. And that bar was called the Praia do Origo, because that's what the Praia is called. And I played the piano in that bar every Saturday night for three years. And the hardest part of the job <laughs> was crossing the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Concert pianist? Did you grow up with classical I was piano? never a concert pianist because I just used to love to play popular, the American popular song. I imagine you built a name for yourself because here you are, this feisty American well, Jew here playing well, piano for well, well, all these American we, classics. It, my co musicians named it the Flitterman Jazz Band. The Flitterman <laughs> Jazz Band, nice name. <laughs> Would you say playing the piano every day is a secret to uh, the fountain of youth also? But it makes you happy. <laughs> makes me happy. That's the key. You're it happy. It makes me happy. Emily, it makes me happy because I know that this is what I do best. And if you ever have moments, if you feel lonely or whatever, you come to the piano and the music just... My friend. This is my friend. <laughs> That's right. It's so true. Yeah, it, it, it does what I ask it to do. It responds. Never talks back. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> yell at you. It doesn't it exactly. As time goes by. Thank you so much for watching our special episode of Holy Land and Covered on location in Porto, Portugal. We really love being here, and I'm sure you could tell from all of the reports that we brought you. This is a place that if you have the opportunity, you must come visit. Thanks again for watching. I'm Emily Francis.